Coog's house after that one. I don't, I don't even know what to say. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to the Locked On Cougars Daily Podcast about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Parker Ainsworth, a uh, Houston born teacher and coach. I'm, I'm all over the place after that kid. That was crazy. Whether you're a Houston fan or just a hater can't step by because it's March Madness, thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first, or in this case, maybe last listen of the day. If you enjoy the conversation but don't know what to say because you're as at a loss for words as I am, tell us in the comments down below the most PG version of whatever came out of your mouth when Garcia hit that three. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn, and we'll get to more on that in a moment. Um, but dear Lord, what a Houston Cougar victory. I was trying to sketch out like what to say in this moment after that game. Um, I want to talk about making a fifth week 16 in a row. Um, I, I got to, I got to, I got to, because that's just something you can't take for granted. I want to try and really break down what actually happened but I also want to take a moment just to like breathe because I was speechless. I, I left that game actually speechless. Um, I say like walked away from my TV. Like I walked away just like holding my head. Like what just happened? Um, it was the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate culture victory for the Houston Cougars. Um, no question about it. Uh, Jamal Shedd played almost a full 45 minutes before fouling out. Five, four of the five starters had five fouls. Um, everyone in a jersey that was – I mean, they are about to pull Mays out of Sammy. There was just – who who didn't play? I mean, could Kellen have put on a jersey and played a few more minutes if they needed him to? I don't, I don't know. I feel bad for J.V. or Francis only getting 19 minutes in foul trouble, but he participated. He had the blocks at the rim, great rim defense. He had his five fouls, though, so his minutes were limited to 19. J1 Roberts had 13 points, eight rebounds, crucial buckets – down the stretch. Manuel Sharp had a career high 30 points. LJ Cryer 20. Jamal Shed 21 and 10. Uh Sedlock came in and had a couple big rebounds. Um uh Malik Wilson had the big back cover the layup. Damian Dunn had a couple big tough pull-up jump shots. Uh Ramon Walker had the putback coming in on one leg with the putback. Uh and then Ryan Stinkin Elvin comes in, gets they let him catch the ball. And foul him. He missed the first one, his first shot in a pressure situation with real pressure, probably since high school. Like we're being really honest, right? And just wet the second ice of the game. Un freaking believable. Uh, the great defense on, I mean, we shouldn't overlook the fact that it was great defensive possessions down the stretch to make sure those points mattered. Um, all kinds of crazy, crazy things. Uh, I said in my cold open after the AM game or after the, um, Longwood game, getting ready for this, that Houston had a statement win on Friday and was going to make a bigger one on Sunday. And that culture win feels like it in every possible way. Aggies, the Aggies had guys that shoot in the 20 percentile, like it, like 20, 24, 26%. Garcia, the guy that hit the, the game going to overtime shot, uh, he shoots 26% from three on less than 50 attempts in his career. And they were making everything. Every foul. I mean, Houston had 28 fouls called against them. AM spent four minutes intentionally fouling, only had 24 fouls called on them, right? Everything about this game was the kind of games that teams lose. And I, frankly, when it went to overtime, the show I was sketching out was like, hey, ran out of gas. Hey, guys are hurt. Hey, like I had to go a whole separate note column just to be prepared because it's just so common that other programs would have lost that game. This program is just that uncommon. They did it. Uh, they stuck it out. Um, I want to talk about the guys in this section. We're talking about culture and what left me speechless. I mean, Ramon Walker played seven minutes, a little bit in their first half, didn't play in the second, and came in once guys fell out afterwards. He is less than six weeks post-lateral meniscus tear. I, I mean, he is out there legitimately on one leg. And... In a key moment in the final minutes, 
He rebounds a missed layup through traffic and hits the putback. They don't win the game without Ramon Walker playing on one leg after having played 48 hours prior. I can't, I can't fathom the toughness in that young man. Uh, Ryan Elvin, the Stones come and make the free throw. Malik Wilson, I... I'm trying to figure out more about Malik, and I'm talking to folks in Louisiana, trying to get more because he seems like a fantastic person. Um, but it sounds like he's been kind of beaten down by coaches along his path for getting to Houston. What a great moment to be like, hey, this guy is a high-level Division One college basketball player, folks. What what were those folks at Texas Tech thinking, right? Like, oh my God, you think they're at home right now? You think they couldn't use him? Just unbelievable. Or or Damian Dunn, his first trip to the entire tournament ever after having played at temple for so long comes in 19 minutes hits two incredibly difficult pull-up jump shots just crazy i got comments here to go through some people commenting stuff they said i'm not going to put up the things that aren't pc uh, or, or aren't uh, not pc but aren't like pg 13 we'll go pg 13 um Closer than needed. Good experiences. Go Cougs. Beat Duke. Beat up in Dallas. And the, uh, nice. I'm trying to get into that one as a media member as well. Walter Williamson adds, this has got to be the most cardiac Cougs match of ever seen. 20 years of viewership. Jamal is a soldier. He had the putback dunk with two hands, by the way. That was crazy. Um, love the intensity they played with. Uh, Parker, what are your thoughts on making opponents? I haven't gotten there yet, dude. I, we'll talk about that this week. We got dates to talk about. I'm just too starstruck of this one. Um, thank you, you also, the man Shredder. Um, John Peterson, Hullabaloo, connect, connect. The Aggies are. I don't want to finish that sentence, John Peterson. Um, Adrian, long fan of the show, says, I was driving home when the game was Taekwondo T. My heart stuck, heart stuck in my stomach. Please tell me that you hit it, you know, red light pulled over or something, got off the road. That's not a game I would have wanted to be driving through. The refs, though, <sighs> that would have been bad. That would have been bad. Um, I thought it was funny at halftime. Um, I, I like Jay Wright at halftime. I should preface this. Like Jay Wright's a great coach, Hall of Fame coach. Um, but he broke down a whole play as if a and were called for the foul when in reality, the foul on the play he was breaking down was called on Cryer. And he acted like this was a crazy physical game. But the foul count at that point is 14-7 to seven Cougs. I mean, it was really, really funny to see that kind of thing break down. Sharp put the world in his shoulders. Um Incredible, incredible. Sharp did look incredible. Uh, Damon Zun's defense is underrated. He's strong. Like, he is, I mean, he's a father. He's a grown man kind of strong. Um, ton of, ton of, ton of fun stuff. Um, I want to save that comment for the end. I'm going to star it. Um, toughness won the game for us. Uh, this is an NBA game with hard-nosed defense. Like, an NBA from, like, the 80s game, maybe? But I'll agree with that. Um, all kinds of fun stuff. Big 12 season coming through. This is so true. Cougs is that Cougs 12. Um, this is why you play in the Big 12, right? You go from in the Big 12, you have like Texas Tech on a Saturday, Iowa State on a Monday, or West Virginia on a uh, Thursday, and then you play, uh, you know, Iowa, uh, Baylor on a Saturday. Those kinds of two games in three days are why you play in this. Nate, I can't sleep here. That's what we're talking at almost midnight right now, right? That's what we're doing. Um, what's up for reaction therapy? Reaction therapy is saying where reaction therapy go. Here you go. Uh, amazing win. Can't we drive to the house, watch them play Duke. Well played, guys. They played for each other. The Samson quote after the game, I thought was particularly impactful. He said, uh, this was not this playing uh, hard or whatever. It was not enough. This kind of you had to play for one another. Um, and ultimately, that's that's the way it went. I do want to point out, Adrian pointed out this uh, first. Adrian said, winning this for Reggie. The last thing I want to say about this game that left me speechless was uh, – the presence of mind of leader of the team, Jamal Shedd, after the game, he's gonna he's talking to John Rothstein on the sideline, and some of those questions can be hit or miss and whatever. Um, but Rothstein asks him what happened in this game, and Jamal Shedd kind of his voice like stutters for a second. He's clearly broken up about something, and he takes a quick moment and just points at the thirty-two patch on his jersey. And says we did this for them. And he points to the thing one more time. Reggie Chaney would have played his butt off tonight. And that's what we had to do. And like he's emotional about it. He turns around and cheers with the crowd. I mean, that's that's the that's the thing behind this team and program and culture right now. Let's go, Coog. Jamal loves Reggie and showed actually amazing respect tonight. I mean, they wear that patch and take a lot of pride in that patch, and it showed. And I know Reggie is proud of this team right now where he was at. Um, that was 
that was just incredible. That was just remarkable. Um, I want to talk about and try and break down like the X's nose basketball side of what just happened in a more like concrete light. Um, I want to do that in a second. But first, I want to do, want to talk to you about being a well-oiled machine like our partners over at Nissan. Um, this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. It was written before this game was over. I'll let you know. But each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's uh, pushed it further than the rest, just like all the 2024 Nissan SUVs. who are able to make it to the next level. Um I want to talk some about like Iowa State and NC State, but these two can only be described as an armada. This one is as hardcore as it gets. It's no wonder they land a spot in the Sweet 16 again this Thursday against Duke in the NCAA tournament. They're a favorite to be picked by in, anybody with a brain to make a run in the NCAA tournament and win the championship. Take the Nissan Rogue, Pathfinder, or Armada and go find your next big adventure shop, NissanUSA.com. Also want to talk some about our buddies over at FanDuel because right now all kinds of things are shifting and changing and all kinds of chaos is happening over at FanDuel as the odds are ever shifting. God, what was the odd like in that game as I went back and forth? Um, right now with March Madness going on, you can say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel you bet on every single game of the tournament, whether you're betting on a big upset or a onesie. It's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. And right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. Your first $5 bet hit. That's 200 bucks to use point spreads, money lines. You can pick who's going at all. We both know at this point it feels awfully good to say Houston. This is FanDuel.com slash locked on bet college hoops until they cut down the net. FanDuel, the sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, comments continue to roll here. I uh, just requested my tickets to Dallas. Let's go. Coach Sampson called this the best he's ever coached. He did say something effective, being the most proud of this team. Cougs are resilient, period. They are pride. Love you guys. It is so nice to have this team wearing Houston across their chest, Cougars across their chest, old school physical basketball. That was So I, I will say the things I liked about watching Houston play the first two of the three Iowa State games are the same kind of thing with that. That was a – Fun game to watch for sure. How about Samson's heart health? I'd be dead of a heart attack a decade ago. Man, that's why he's the goat. <laughs> like that's that's just what it is. Okay, I tried between the game and going live now to break down something about the X's and O's, like trying to talk about the actual basketball, what, what just happened. Because um, I do take pride, you know, Houston born teacher and coach and trying to talk about basketball from an X and O's perspective. I think we all know what like an out route is in football or a blitz and like, basketball is one that people are trying to pick up with. I will say that the inconsistency in refing things bothered me tonight. And I said, well, I got one comment here about the set. The rest were part of the show tonight. Um, from an X and O's perspective, I thought the refs altered the game. And here's what I mean by that is I actually think Houston did commit a lot of fouls, right? I think they got called for 28. I bet if I went back and clipped it through, I'd probably say they did commit 23, right? Like I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with more than three, four, maybe five foul calls. Um, I think my issue with the foul calls, and I tweeted this as much, um, was really more about I kind of felt like it was physical both ways, and it's going to be called tight. It's going to be called tight the lineup rotations only got impacted on Houston's behalf because of the foul calls. And so the way it was going was Houston was benching guys like Francis and Texas A&M was being able to play their starters because of these foul calls. Right. And so it was called tights, call it tight. Both teams have to sit their starters because they're getting foul trouble. Cool. Whatever. If you call it loose, call it loose. Let both teams get physical, whatever. Like I is the consistency that was troublesome to me. Um, I, I I will say that um, on the whole, you play through it. That's what Samson would say. That's what his son would say. The Aquinas would say. Hollis would say. Jamal would say. LJ, and so on and so forth, right? They would all say you just play through it, and they did in one. It's much easier to talk about this after a win, right? Um, American Airlines Center does need to become for Tita North for this game. Duke will travel well. they got a national fan base as well for its worth, but um, I think we can make the trip up 45. 45 can give kind of you know, just very green at times. Um but I hope, I hope we make a trip up north. Trying to get a media ticket into that one for sure. Um, I will say, uh, from an X's nose perspective, on the court, not the rest, but on the court, um, what Houston did a great job of doing to me was, A, 
playing the situation. They knew what the refs were. They knew what the foul count was, et cetera. And they kind of wouldn't start an action or motion unless they get in a wide open shot until like 12 or 14 seconds left in the shot clock to intentionally kind of preserve time, preserve their legs. And they knew the more possessions they played, the more fouls that could get called. Right. And so that was intentionally strategic. And I thought it was impressive to see them switch to that about five, 10 minutes into the game. Uh, Jamal Shedd would then, because he was so hard to guard and Wade Taylor can't guard him. So they weren't even trying to put him on. And Houston would run different sets to try and get him switched onto big men to where he could isolate. And then he had the freedom with a couple different actions to, once they got switched on a big man, uh, he could drive and kick. Uh, he could drive and he did it a couple different times. He dropped it off to Jawan. I thought Jawan's, he dropped it off with uh, Shed, dropped it with left hand. Jawan took uh, two dribbles right hand, the finish back with the left at the front of the rim. Some of those plays were really, really pretty to watch, way it unfolded. I love the dribble handoff he had with Cryer, two for three, but it was all you know, predicated on they can't cover this guy. So we're going to get the late in the shot clock and then put him in a couple different spots to make a decision. And Jamal had more turnovers than he typically has. Game. He uh, ain't even forced him to five turnovers. And there was a stretch where he had like three in a row right after the putback dunk. I almost wonder like if he clipped his hand on the rim or something and like had a little bit of a swollen finger or what the deal was. Cause that was very uncharacteristic. Um, but outside of that stretch, he really made a ton of great decisions as he does as you know, what makes him my, you know, vote for player of the year in all of college basketball um, and finding driving kicks for three, finding relocating of different guys like Sharp and stuff like that. I thought one time um, they kind of deked, like like Francis would kind of come screen for Jamal like he'd been doing to get the switch. And then he went and set a flare screen to get Cryer popped out for three. That was a pretty setup too. Um, on the whole though, they just ran simple, quick actions at the end of the shot clock like they do and let Jamal make the decisions. And again, I, I don't, if you're not voting him for player of the year, I don't, I don't know what you do. I, I, like I, I, I understand that RJ Davis is really good. And um, that connect kid at Tennessee has had a great season so far and all of that. But I, I just, I just don't know how you pick anyone above Jamal shed. I like, Number one team in the country, fighting through all the adversity they did that night. He played 40, he's listed at 45 minutes because it was more than 44 and a half minutes on uh, the round of 32 game, went to 195 in overtime, getting to the Sweet 16. I mean, Jamal Shedd and Joanne Roberts have never not been to the Sweet 16, right? Like, that's that's who we're talking about here. Um, other things, schematic, I thought was interesting on defense. Houston tried a couple different things once they got into foul trouble. Um, I thought they did a tremendous job in this game of what we would call in programs I've been a part of a time switch, right? And so, like, in a shot clock, because the league I play in actually does have a shot clock. The SPC has a shot clock. And we say, okay, we're going to play a 2-3 zone and try and make them pass the ball around. And then at we would say higher in the shot clock because we're slower than Houston is, but we would say at, you know, at 16 seconds, we're going to man, just cover the nearest guy to you. Right. And Houston did several times in this game of running that kind of switch. It's in a two, three zone to make a slow down for a second. And then at like eight seconds of the shot clock, they'd all just grab the closest man and kind of change up and kind of, it kind of mucks up the play that the Aggies are trying to run. They got to quickly, you know, convert what they're doing into more of a man sets. It also puts you close to the guy to box out when the shot goes up. Um, did a great job of dealing with those kinds of things. And then I mentioned the adversity. I mean, yes, AM shot poorly from the free throw line. They shot 45 free throws. AM shot 15 more free throws than Houston did. And AM was the one that intentionally fouled for four minutes to get the ball back. How does that even happen? A um, couple more comments here before we get to the last segment. I think we get the feeling it was the three or four different games in. One, I think there was a chess match between Buzz and Samson. I appreciated the coaching back and forth, given the circumstances. Um, four stars for UH, but only one for AM fouled out. Um, did feel a little bit ridiculous. Thank God Ramon got the big rebound in overtime. Refs weren't consistent. I agree. The last foul on Cryer, I, if anything, I thought uh, Wade Taylor pushed off before. I thought it was a no call myself, but they didn't listen to me. Kent Cole's his best game. Uh, ever, including Big E against you say in the uh, the uh, the Astrodome. 
I'll take your word for it. I wasn't there. I, I, I try to, you know, I teach history during the day, so I try to give credence to old games, but I wasn't at that one. This one, it was in the tournament, though, so it probably counts a little bit higher, right? Um, Statue was saying that they were surprised Shed didn't get benched until he fell down. Sega Samson might put Cryer at the, like, in a few times, at the one, at the point guard, like, in a few times this year, put Ramon at the four. I wonder because of when Ramon played, if they tried him out in the first half at the end of the half, and at halftime he was like, guys, I'm really sore. I, I don't, my knee's not right. Like, I, I, no one has said that. I don't mean to say I'm not, a, I'm not reporting that. This is not journalism. I'm just guessing based on body language and stuff. And then, of course, he steps in and makes one of the biggest rebounds of the game. So, what do I know, right? But just tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. Um, as far as getting shed out, I think the biggest thing was their offense was entirely predicated on. They don't have one that can guard him. And and so if you take him out of the game, you're worried about what secondary offense you're going to try and run. You know, Cryer's not the same kind of downhill athlete. If you put Sharp with the guy going downhill, you can't kick it to Sharp, right? Like those kinds of things make uh, for a little bit of problem. Um, I think they've tried to do Malik Wilson in that kind of instance a couple times, but the, the advantage Shed had in this game was his strength, not his speed. Malik Wilson's got the same speed, but not the same strength across his shoulders and chest. Um, and so they said they can't come. We're going to play in the whole game. And frankly, you know, save for a bogus foul here, there, I, Jamal Shed was playing like he could have played another four or five minutes. He missed a couple front end of free throws that made me think his legs were a little tired. He was seven of 10 from the stripe. Um, so, you know, maybe a little bit, but on the whole, I, I was, I was flabbergasted. I can't believe they just did that. All right. Um, we are going to talk some about what comes out of this as well as just stand and stare in awe at the Samson Samson and company program for a second in the last segment. But first Houston's put together a team of some of the best quality basketball players and people in America. And when you're hiring for your small business, you want to do the same. You want to hire professionals that are right for the role you need. They need to come and get rebounds like Ramon Walker. They need to come in and hit threes like LJ Cryer. They get uh, you know blocks like Javier Francis or whatever the right job is that you need them to do. And that's what we got to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools you need to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free because LinkedIn is not just another job board. LinkedIn is a vast network of more than a billion with a B professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you a chance to uh, access professionals that you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. It's linkedin.com slash locked on college. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. All right. Cougars After Dark is officially past the midnight button at this point, and I could not be running on further i mean i'm just i'm gassed up ready to go folks um all right so i said in my last segment here i was gonna talk about the sweet 16 i have watched only a little bit of duke i watched a more but i've watched some of duke this weekend i know houston plays duke the sweet 16 i believe it's thursday night. i don't think they're gonna play it on good friday in dallas but i think i believe it's thursday night um I also know that um, Duke has had a roller coaster year in themselves, and that's about all I know about Duke. Outside of some anecdotal stuff and watching them more, just because I have basketball on all the time. I got right now. I got highlights from basketball on all the time. Right. Um, thanks, James on Fire TV. By the way, what I will say though is that this is the fifth consecutive Sweet Sixteen. Houston has made the Sweet Sixteen every year since 2019. 2019 was Galen Robinson, was uh, Corey Davis. Armani's junior and actually into being his last year, right? Fabian White was a sophomore. Nate Hinton was on the roster of freshmen. Um, that team, that team was the first one to get this far. And I remember when Galen and those guys got there in 2016, thinking like, oh my Lord, like Houston's back. I, see, I'm thinking at the time, I'm thinking like, is this like Houston's back to being – like, where are we going with this? What era of Houston Cougar basketball are we going with this? Um, and then they end up playing Kentucky in the Sweet 16. Kentucky was, like, not the Kentucky of, like, a bajillion McDonald's All-Americans. I do believe that was Shea Gillich Alexander, um, who's now, like, an NBA All-Star. Um, but, it, you know, beating Ohio State and, and getting to that game was tremendous, right? It was very, very impressive. It felt like a high. Now it's kind of the norm. And obviously that goes back to 
Galen and Corey and and the, the work the guys put in to build this program from a player perspective. It goes to Samson and what Samson Samson Company have done from a coaching perspective. I mean, the next time that there was a postseason, because that was 2019, 2020, there was none because of COVID. 2021, Houston's in the final four. And that was it sheds a freshman, but you had Sasser, Ladiki, uh, Quentin Grimes, uh, Reggie Chaney's in Houston that year, right? Like that's that's a, an impressive roster in and of itself. Uh, they make the Elite Eight the next year with Ramon, uh, Kyler, Jay Wan's on that team, Josh Carlton's on that team. Uh, last year, they they got the Sweet 16. Um, and frankly, you can see the difference between last year and 2019 when like last year was kind of like, oh my God, I can't believe we got bounced. March Madness did the March Madness thing to us last year, right? Where we get the hot team at the wrong time um, in Miami. Um, but we added, you know, Emmanuel last year, Terrence, who can't play the show, but last year, um, that was Jairus's one and done year. Obviously the impact he had on the program and team last year. Um, and now we're transitioning into this year's group and next year it's mercy. And next year it's, uh, you know, we're expecting a big jump from Terrence and Emmanuel and, and Javier will be like in his second year as a full-time starter and da, 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 all those kind of things. Right. And who knows who else joins the roster and between now and then the transport is crazy. Something like 2000 people in already. Right. Um, but what I want to stress is this run since 2019, making the sweet 16 every year since 2019 doesn't just happen for reference. Houston's made the tournament every year since 2018. Only five other schools have an active streak that is the same. Five. five like the, in all of the 300-plus Division One college basketball teams, only five have an active streak of making the tournament as many times as Houston has, right? We've made every Sweet 16 since 2019. It It's really, really ridiculous when you think about it that – when you go back and look at the pictures of empty half Hines or whatever, and like that's where the program was, that's where the program is now. And Walter says that I can't believe how far the program has come. This is such an era. I I think there's something to be said when this season's over, and I hope it doesn't end for another couple weeks, right? There's something to be said about comparing this second half of the 10 year Samson's been here and further, the Samson era to that five slam and jam era, not because the peaks were as high. I mean, we made one final four and potentially counting, right? Um, whereas that team made it three years in a row. But I do think the fact that it's longer, more consistent, I'd argue college basketball's got more talent spread out across it, but I'd probably be arguing with the old people on that one. Just wildly, wildly impressive. And I just, I, I want to make sure, and I think that the cool thing about March Madness is we had games Friday and Sunday. We don't play again until Thursday. The players need to rest up, need to watch film, need to study tape. You and I get to breathe and enjoy this for a second. Um, this is unbelievable. This is incredible representation of the University of Houston. This is an incredible representation of the city of Houston. Right, um, to step into the Big 12 in year one, win the regular season of the conference, get to the conference championship game in the tournament, uh, have that game against AM in the March Madness. The, I mean, people were picking them like they're the best nine seed of all time across different networks and stuff. I mean, Houston is in an incredible place, and I cannot stress enough that when we have these down days in between games, that sometimes you just have to sit and enjoy it. Now, I don't I don't know how to go to sleep after that game. I don't I don't I don't know. Um it is Monday, March 25th already. We are officially over the midnight line. Cougars of Dark has gone into Cougars before sunrise. I don't are we call it the morning yet. Um I I just I cannot believe they won that so many teams and programs don't even get to that point, let alone win that basketball game with all those things working against us. Oh, Raymond Jones tell me I'm already wrong. They play Friday at 640. Houston's going to play on Good Friday. If they win, they're going to play on Easter. Wow, interesting. Well, thank you, Raymond. Um, all right, so thank you for corrections. I'll be doing this thing each and every day here at Locked on Cougs. Um, have to say Tuesday's episode's up in the air right now. Long story, but right now we're riding the highs, 
We're enjoying it. Um, blue blood jet. Cannon says, I feels like it. Blood's feeling a little blue. It's actually white cougar red, but you feel me that right. Um, Thank you all so much for tuning in to Locked on Cougs. All kinds of great post-game content each and every day. I appreciate you making us your listen for that, as well as your first listen today if you're listening on, to us on audio platforms. Locked on Cougs is a proud Locked on Podcast Network. That means your team, our number one Cougs, our Houston Cougars in the Sweet 16 once again each and every day. Go Cougs! Go Cougs!